one, Mr. Grinch. You really are a heel. You're as cuddly as a cactus. You're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. You're a bad banana with a greasy black peel. You're a monster, Mr. Grinch. Your heart's an empty hole. Your brain is full of spiders. You've got garlic in your soul, Mr. Grinch. I wouldn't touch you with a 39 and a half foot pole. You're a vile one, Mr. Grinch. You have termites in your smile. You have all the tender sweetness of a seasick crocodile, Mr. Grinch. Given the choice between the two of you, I'd take the seasick crocodile. You're a foul one, Mr. Grinch. You're a nasty, wasty skunk. Your heart is full of unwashed socks. Your soul is full of gunk, Mr. Grinch. The three words that best describe you are as follows, and I quote, Stink, stank, stunk. You're a rotter, Mr. Grinch. You're the king of sinful sots. Your heart's a dead tomato splotched with moldy purple spots, Mr. Grinch. Your soul is an appalling dump heap, overflowing with the most disgraceful assortment of deplorable rubbish imaginable, mangled up in tangled up knots. You nauseate me. Mr. Grinch, with a nauseous super nos. You're a crooked jerky jockey and you drive a crooked horse, Mr. Grinch. You're a three-decker sauerkraut and toadstool sandwich with arsenic sauce. All right. Hey, welcome to Graceway Christmas. And we kick off our series today. I'm so excited about the series Grinches. Listen, we all have Grinches in our life, and those Grinches come to steal our joy. They cause us great pain, but ultimately they steal our joy. And so the goal is, this Christmas we're going to learn how we can take back our joy from the Grinches that have stolen it, right? And, uh, man, I'm excited. Hey, real quickly, can we just give a great big hand to all of our volunteers that helped put together Whoville here at Graceway? <laughs> Did they do a great job? Man, I'm telling you, what a team. Those folks are creative. I don't have a creative bone in my body, but, man, they're creative. And I love when I bring a vision to them. They just flesh it out and make it happen. And it looks great. So, so thankful for all of our volunteers and our team here. Man, it's good stuff. Hey, listen. As I was growing up, you know, and maybe as you're growing up, we all have things that uh, happen, whether traditions or just things that made us feel really good. And, you know, as we grow up into adulthood, we try to duplicate those things. Uh, you know, we try to have those things that we try to duplicate. We try to make those things happen again because we want that warm, fuzzy feeling that we felt when it first happened the first time, right? Well, I remember growing up in my house, my brother and I, we always had this thing that we did. It was just a tradition. And we loved it. Man, I, it's just great. In fact, it's carried on into my adult life. And I'm still growing up. But, you know, it, it carries over. And, and I don't know if you ever have a movie that you just like watch over and over and over and over, and you just can't get enough of it. Well, there was this movie that was never meant to be like a hit, like a, a chart stopper, billboard buster, never meant to be any of those. It was just a low-budget film that ended up turning into a classic 
overnight. Anybody remember the story, A Christmas Story? Anybody remember that movie? I love A Christmas Story movie. It's great. It really is. You know, Red Rider BB gun. No, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. Listen, I love A Christmas Story. In fact, my brother and I created a tradition. Every single Christmas, we would sit down, we would fix this great big cup of hot chocolate our way. None of this open up a packet of stuff and pour it in hot water. None of that. It was like the real deal, man. We made our own hot chocolate, popped us a big old bowl of popcorn, and we sat back and we watched A Christmas Story. Man, it was great. Every single year. And then as we grew up and moved miles apart, we still did that every year. And it, many times it was just me. Nobody ever wanted to watch it with me. I would just sit down in, in a chair, hot chocolate, popcorn, and I'm watching a Christmas movie like it was the very first time I have ever seen it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, you watch those parts and you're like, you've laughed at that same part a hundred thousand times, but it is still funny every single time. And then... There's a period about five years of the last five years of my life, twists, turns, ups and downs, around corners, curves, and I didn't get to watch a Christmas story. I, I didn't have my hot chocolate, I didn't have my popcorn, it was disappointing. Something was missing. I wanted so bad to sit down and do that all over again, just like we did when we were kids. And I wanted to feel that same feeling that we felt when we were kids. Do you know how many times, no matter how many times, you try to recreate the fuzzy feeling? You never can recreate that fuzzy feeling. It was a moment. It was a memory. It was something special. It was something important. And when you can't recreate that, when it doesn't go as planned, when things don't turn out the way you think they ought to turn out, it is downright frustrating. It's disappointing. I remember the first time I couldn't carry on that tradition. And I sat down and I cried like a baby. No joke. Listen, I'm an emotional mess, all right? I cried like a baby. And people are like, what? What do you mean crying because you don't get to watch a movie? But it was special to me. It was important to me. It didn't mean a thing to anybody else, but it meant something to me. Maybe you've had those times. Maybe it was a Thanksgiving tradition. Maybe it was Christmas tradition. Maybe you did everything that you could to put all the pieces of the puzzle in place. You wanted everything to work out just right. You wanted everybody to enjoy it and everybody to have this and feel this way and be able to enjoy this and do this and do that. And in the end, something happened and it didn't work out the way you planned for it to. You ever had that meal where you fix, you cook, you've done everything you know to do and you thought you had it all worked out and you didn't have enough turkey? Or you run out of deviled eggs. I don't understand why Christians eat deviled eggs anyways, right? Why can't we have angel eggs, right? Come on. That's why we had angel food cake, right? And then we put strawberries on top of it. Whoa, glory to God, we're in heaven now, right? Yeah, yeah. But when things don't work out the way that we planned, it's frustrating. It's hard. And we struggle with that. Maybe you've had some of those things that didn't quite work out that way, and it brought you great pain. Well, if you're taking notes this week, I hope that you'll use the note-taking sheet found in your worship guide today. There's a lot of notes to be taken today, and I hope you'll go back and, and, and follow up with those and look over those again, because I think they could help you during the Christmas season. Because that's exactly what we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks. We're talking about Grinches. What is a Grinch? See, today's message is stressed to the max. Now, I know that's not for you, and I know that probably nobody here is stressed already. I'm just going to tell you, I just get stressed thinking about the holidays. I really do. I just get stressed thinking about going here and doing this and doing that and pleasing this one and pleasing that one, and I do this right, and I do this on time. Did I get it? Woo! 
Oh, man, it is mind-blowing. It's stressful. Stressed to the max. Stress is a Grinch. I don't know if you know that or not. It is a Grinch. What is a Grinch? Well, let's just identify for this series what a Grinch really is. A Grinch is those things that cause us pain and they take away our joy. That's a Grinch. They cause us pain and they take away our joy. If I could for a moment, I want to talk to all those people here in the room or those folks here watching us on our iCampus who are the managers. If I could just talk to the managers for a moment, people who manage stuff or they're detailed people. They manage stuff. You know, they're all about the details. Yeah, th those people, those people. In, in fact, my wife is super duper uber uber detailed. She is a manager from the word go, 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 go. All right? Crazy, crazy. Detailed to the nth degree. Me? I am not. <laughs> I'm a big picture guy. I, I, I see the big picture. Listen, I don't care about all those 1,000 pieces of the puzzle. That doesn't make sense to me. You ever tried putting together a 1,000 piece puzzle? Forget it. It's, it's mind boggling. I'm the guy that looks at the box and goes, man, I love this picture. This is what it's supposed to look like right here, right? Yeah. And she's like, yeah, but this piece has to go here. Oh, oh, and here, oh, this piece over here, it fits right here. And I'm like, call me in 30 minutes when you get done, because that's about how long it's going to take her, 30 minutes maybe. She'll get finished with it. She goes, what do you think? I think it makes me sick. You know. Yeah, I, detailed. I am the big picture. I want to talk to you managers, you detail people. And I also want to talk to us people who, you know, like me, who get on the nerves of people who are detailed, people who are the managers. I'm sure I get on her nerves. You know, she'll have, I give her the big picture. She asks me 150 questions. And I'm like, listen, I don't care when, I don't care where, I don't care how. It doesn't, well, well how do you want that? I don't care. It doesn't matter. You know, it, it, it drives her nuts. So I'm thinking about the end result. Hey, listen, pulling off something like this, I love it when they come to me and they go, well, what's your vision for this? What do you think about this? What color for this? I said, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea. I don't know. That looks good. Yeah, that's great. I don't know. Then I walk in, I look at everything, and I go, wow, this is awesome. This is exactly what I had in mind. This is great. But that's the difference in the managers, the detail people, and the people like me who are the big picture people. In fact, we're going to look at a story in the Bible of a person who was a manager. And we're going to talk about how she felt as she was going through this huge get-together that kind of went sideways on her, if you will. For fun, real quick, I wonder how many of you have recently maybe... Uh, maybe recently uh, hosted a, a big dinner or a big event where you had a lot of people there and you had to put all these details together, you know, to host everybody. Or maybe you're getting ready to for Christmas. Anybody done that recently or you're getting ready to? Yeah, yeah. Some of y'all are honest enough to lift your hands. The rest of y'all are just liars. Y'all got to get over yourselves. Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Here's the deal. This is what happened to this lady. Except it's a little bit different. It's crazy stressful, all right, when everything doesn't go as planned. If we look at Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, I want to share a story with you that I believe is a story that we can all relate to today. And watch how the scripture plays out. It says in verse number um, 38 of Luke chapter 10, As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now, I need you to understand, this was a celebration that wasn't really family. It wasn't for family, but this was for Jesus. It was for him and his disciples and maybe a few other people that were with him. They were on their way from uh, where they were, traveling through uh, Bethany to get to Jerusalem. And as they're traveling through, they needed a place to stop over. And 
get this, there's basically no notice, okay? This is not the day where they picked up the cell phone and they said, hey, are, are you good for Monday night at 7 o'clock? No, that's not going to work for us. Can we do Tuesday night at 6 o'clock? No, that's not going to work. Can we do Friday night? That, that, that's not what they had. In fact, they're traveling through Bethany and she heard that they needed a place to stop over and eat and she said, oh yeah, I'll be happy to host them. Now, I just can only imagine Mary, her sister, when, um, you know, she said that, or anybody else that might have been standing around, because husbands, wives, how many times have you been standing right beside your spouse and somebody asks you about going to dinner or maybe about plans or whatever, and you're like, oh yeah, we can do that, and the other person's like, what are you doing? We don't want 25 people at our house. We're not ready for that. What were you thinking? Well, I was thinking it'd be fun. I was thinking it'd be nice. Why don't I have 25 people in our house? Hey, no big deal. It's a house, right? That's what it's for. Roof over your head. Invite them. Bring them on in. Well, here's what happens. Man, Martha has agreed to do this. Now, that's pretty cool. But keep in mind, Martha didn't have Sam's Club. She didn't have Walmart. She didn't have all the, the places like Gordon's Food, and she didn't have Costco and all these things where she could go buy in bulk and fix it and be ready to prepare a great meal for Jesus and his followers. No, she didn't have any of that. Not only did she not have any of that, but could you imagine feeding that many people and she didn't have a stove, an oven, a microwave, refrigerator? She had none of the modern conveniences that you and I have. Oh, my stress level just went up. Can you imagine having to prepare a meal for all these people? And it is not like putting it in the microwave and 30 seconds later, ding! Pop it out, right? That's my way of cooking. Yeah, because in our household, if there's a meal to be had, I'm not the one cooking it, <laughs> all right? And my, my meal is, hey, everybody get in the car, we're going to Fred's, right? You know, come on, everybody get in the car, we're going somewhere, we're going to eat. I, I'm not cooking. I don't cook anything. In fact, anytime I've tried to cook, you always know you're not a good cook when they say, hey, can you get the ice? Is that all you need? Well, I was cooking. Oh, I got this. You go get the ice. You go fix the drinks. All right, I'll be glad to take on that hard task, right? Yeah, I'm going to fix the drinks. Man, I'm glad I got this. I know y'all can't handle that. I got the drinks, you know? And then we all sit at the table, and they're like, but, but I wanted sweet tea. I thought you said water. No, I, I asked for Coke. I could have sworn that you said you wanted sweet tea. You know, I'm like, forget it. I'm not even doing drinks. How about I put the ice out and you all pour your own drinks, right? Yeah, that's how it always rolls. But can you imagine the stress that Martha must have been going through? Oh, and, and, and wait, let's don't forget cleanliness. Listen, when I was growing up, there were only two types of cleaning. There was regular clean, and that was clean, right? And then there was guest clean. Now, guest clean is where people are coming over the house and we really got to get everything clean because people are going to look at every crook, cranny, and, 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 and crevice. That's where mom says, get the toothbrush, you're cleaning the tops of the baseboards. And I'm going, but mom, ain't nobody eating off the baseboards. But they're going to look and see. <laughs> You know, you got to go to the baseboard. Hey, here's guest. Here's guest clean. Where mama comes in and over every service, service, she puts on a glove and she does this number. Listen, if you come to our house, please don't bring your white gloves because there will be dust. We live there. Amen? But now, can you imagine Martha's stress? There's regular clean. There's guests clean, and watch this, there's Jesus clean. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus just upped the playing field. He just upped the game a little bit. What is Jesus clean? That means spick and span to spick and span, 
right? I mean, it is way worse than guest cleaning. Absolutely. So imagine this. She's rushing around. She's cleaning. She's cooking. She's making sure this one's got an extra drink. This one needs more pillows. This one needs another napkin. She's running in every different direction. She's pulled everywhere. She's starting to get a little frayed. Y'all know what it means when you start to get a little frayed? She's getting a little stressed. She's getting a little frustrated. She's getting a little more than what she needs to be getting, right? And at this point, it's not looking pretty. In fact, the Scripture says, verse 39, her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet. How dare her? She sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner that she was preparing. Hmm. Now think about this for just a moment. She's looking everywhere. She hadn't seen her sister in an hour. Where is she? What is going on with Mary? And she pops the door open, and lo and behold, there sits Mary on the floor at the feet of Jesus, just listening to the conversation, listening to Jesus. What happened? Well, there are two things to notice here. Notice what it says, says but Martha was distracted. She was distracted by the dinner, by the details, by all the stuff she had to do. Now watch this. In order for somebody to be distracted, they're supposed to be focused on something else. The focus Mary had right. Mary was focused on Jesus. That's where her focus should have been. But Martha was distracted. I don't know if you notice this, but because I am of the male species, and by the way, there's only two species, male and female, amen? I, I don't know, just making sure everybody understands that and knows it. There's only two, but, but because I'm of the male species, have you ever noticed that when we go out to dinner, we went out to dinner the other night, and we went to this restaurant, and there were... 15 TVs all around the wall. Now, every TV has something different on it. One has soccer, one has hockey, one has baseball, one has football, and a plethora of other things that I could care less about. In fact, there's nothing on any of those televisions that interests me at all. But because I'm of the male species, any movement on any of those TV screens catches my eye. Now, I was with my wife, so my focus was supposed to be, I got you, baby. My focus is supposed to be on her, and I want my focus to be on her, but I can be looking at her, and a ball can fly on that TV, and I look up. I don't give a flip about that ball flying on that TV, but because I'm a man, I'm distracted from what I'm supposed to be focused on. Now, man, you'll help yourselves out right now if you'll just all go ahead and admit, yeah, that's me. I do that. I get distracted, and, and I don't focus when I should be focusing. Right? Okay. Good for you. Good job. All right, ladies, cut them some slack. Grace. Give them the grace way. Okay? Yeah. Think about the word distracted. The word distracted in the Greek means to get dragged around. Here's the best way I know how to describe this. When I was a little boy, I was young, and we had this golden retriever. He was a big old dog, beautiful golden retriever. His name was Rascal. And, and, and you could put this, I could put this um, uh, leash on Rascal, and, and as I'd hold him, I mean, he was wagging me all over the place. He drug me over here, and then he dragged me over here, and then he dragged me back over here, and I'm over here. I mean, I mean I'm just going everywhere. I mean, he's dragging me all over the place. That's what the word distracted here in the Greek means. Dragged in many different directions all over the place so that we are not focused on anything. 
And then all of a sudden, something happens. Because Martha was distracted, she came to Jesus. Now, this is a start, okay? Let's cut her some slack. She came to Jesus, but she didn't come in the proper way. Martha's afraid, remember? She's stressed. She's frustrated. Martha comes to Jesus, and what does she do? She unloads on Jesus. This is not good, folks. She unloads on Jesus. Watch what she says. She walks in and she says, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister sits here while I do all the work? Have you ever noticed that when we get stressed and we get frustrated, we always take our frustrations out on the wrong people? We take our frustrations out on the people who love us most, on the people who do the most for us, on the people who care about us more than anybody else. She was angry. She was having a bad day. She came in. Was she really angry at Jesus? No. She was angry at her sister Mary. She was angry at the situation. But she unloaded on Jesus, the one who loved her most. Watch this. And now she proceeds to give a direct command to the creator, the ruler of the universe. Do you catch this? Jesus, tell her to come help me. Well, all right then. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, wait, best I remember... She is just Martha. This is Jesus she's talking to. How dare her to tell Jesus, tell her to come help me. Oh, nope, nope. That would not be happening. I'd be like, girl, let me tell you something. Uh, no, -uh. I ain't telling her nothing. You do what you need to do. She is right where she needs to be. But again, that's why I'm not Jesus. <laughs> Jesus pauses. Have you ever been at a Christmas dinner, a Thanksgiving dinner, a family gathering, and everything's going really good, and all of a sudden, that person, everybody's got that person in their family, speaks up, opens their mouth, they don't think about what they're saying, they don't care about what they're saying, boom, it comes out and everybody gets silent. And everybody backs up, everybody's watching. Did y'all hear what they just said? We're waiting to see what the next move is. Something's about to go down in this house. She has just come in and unloaded on Jesus. She has just made a direct command to Jesus, and the room gets silent, and everybody's waiting. <gasps> Uh-oh. What is Jesus about to say? What's the next thing that's about to happen in this place? Uh-oh. You ready for it? The next verse. Watch what Jesus says. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha. Jesus, are you sick? Do I need to get you some Tylenol? Did you hear what she just said to you? My dear Martha? Hey, hang on just a second. Jesus, I would not let her talk to you like that. If I was... I would not, I, I would not let, what? Settle down? Okay. My dear Martha. Now, come on, you've got to be wondering the same thing I am. Why in the world did Jesus respond that way? Why did he let her off the hook? Why did he not just let her have it? Yeah, Martha's having a bad day. It was meant to be a good day. 
But what if Jesus wanted everybody to know that while Martha may be having a bad day, Martha's not a bad person? Well, what if God was really showing Martha grace? What if, what if he was really saying, Martha, okay, you, you went off the handle, you didn't handle it properly, but Martha, guess what? You're not a bad person. I still love you. I still for you. I've still got your back. It's okay. You see, Martha really may be struggling with the fact that she loves people so much that she just wants to make everything right. My wife, I think maybe today my illustrations are more about my wife because she's actually on the front row today. So, but I'm thinking, I'm, my, my wife loves to cook. She's a really good cook, by the way. We don't get to eat at home very much because we're always on the go and running here and there and everything, but, but she's a really good cook. And so, first of the week, we were thinking about Thanksgiving. And we were talking about what we were going to do and what we wanted to cook for Thanksgiving. And, you know, I just, I don't take a whole lot of things too seriously. And I said, hey, don't you worry about cooking. Don't you worry about, Fred's is open from 11 to 4. We'll just go to Fred's and we'll just have Thanksgiving there. She goes, uh-uh, no, you did not just say that. Nothing against Fred's. She looks at me and she says, listen, I don't get to be home very often to cook on my stove. So I am cooking a Thanksgiving meal. Now you need to know something. Everything she cooks is with tender care. Every dish is just right. Everything's turned just right. It's all, it's all cooked right. It's all seasoned right. Everything's just really good, delicious. And when she cooks it, she wants you to eat it when it's hot. She says, because I put love into this, I put time into this, I put all I got in because I love you, because I care for you, and I want you to eat it when it's hot because that's when it tastes the best. But being of the male species, and being that I'm not in the kitchen actually doing the cooking, I go and do other things. And I'll start something that I think is going to take five minutes, and it takes 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And she'll come in and she'll say, it'll be ready in 10 minutes. Okay, I can do something else. I go do something else, and she'll come in and she'll go, it'll be ready in five minutes. Okay, all right, I think I can do something else over here. I'm doing something else. She came in and she said, it's ready. Surely I can pull off one more thing real quick. Listen, she don't like for anybody to eat cold mashed potatoes. I thought I was okay with it until I tasted them. <laughs> and then I understood why she wanted them hot. Did you ever think that, that might have been how Martha was? Martha wanted everything right. She wanted all the food hot. She wanted to make sure everybody was comfortable, make sure everybody had refills, make sure everybody had plenty of napkins, because we all like extra napkins. Hello? Martha, out of her love and out of her concern, just wanted to make sure that everything was right. Here's what's amazing. Martha's real problem was this. Martha was a person with a big heart. She loved people. She loved Jesus. She loved all of these people being in her home. And she just wanted to do the best she could do. And let's don't fault her because isn't that what we should want also? To give Jesus our best? I mean, let's be honest, we could have shown up this morning and they could have just put up a simple little tree on the platform and said, okay, Christmas at Graceway. But you know what our creative team wanted? They wanted to do their best for Jesus. In fact, all of this that you see, they didn't do this for you. And they didn't do this for me. They did this for Him. It's all Martha wanted, really. Big heart. But having such a big heart, she lost the big picture. 
Now listen, I'm going to tell you, I'm the first one to tell you, I love all the lights, the sound, the bells, the whistles. I love all the decorations. I love all of this stuff. But this is not the big picture. These are all details that can help us in the big picture. But I just prayed yesterday and all week long. God, I love all this stuff. It's so cool. It sets the atmosphere for the series and all that kind of good stuff. And, and, and I love setting the atmosphere. I'm all about the atmosphere. But when the atmosphere becomes greater than the Savior, we've lost the big picture. See, if we're not careful, we can become just like Martha. And we can get so caught up in the details, so caught up in all the things of the season that we forget the big picture. In fact, I'm thankful that Jesus is here today. And he doesn't care whether we have a sound system or not. He doesn't care whether we have lights or not, air conditioning or not, decorations or not. What he really cares about is, are we willing to sit at his feet? And are we willing to absorb his presence? That's what Jesus is wanting from us. It's the big picture. Because let's face it, two years from now, you may not even be able to remember what this series was this year. I mean, I can look back and go, okay, this year we did this, this year we did this, this year we did this. You know why? Because I was right in the middle of it. I was preparing it. I just had somebody at the first service this morning. I said, um, yeah, I said every year, every other year we try to do a fun series. And they've been here since the beginning. And they said, well, what did we do year before last? I said, you mean we went all that work of doing Charlie Brown Christmas and you don't even remember that we did Charlie Brown? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See how quickly we forget. So it doesn't really matter to God. What matters to God is that you and I don't lose sight of the big picture. And, and if you and I didn't really know Martha's heart, you and I would think that she was cranky. We would think she was impossible to get along with. We might even say she's a type A personality. And you know what probably is? She might have been. We, we might have even said, man, that woman is difficult. I don't know what her problem is. She's just difficult to get along with, though. She's high strung. Really? Seriously? That, that is, if you don't know, Martha's heart. And if you're a manager or a detail person, you'll probably admit with me this morning that there are probably many times you've been misunderstood. People misunderstood you as a detail person, and maybe they thought you were cranky or impossible or difficult or, or high-strung. Maybe they thought all these negative things about you, and you're just being who God created you to be. And that's a good thing. But in the middle of being detailed, don't forget to anchor yourself to the big picture so that you don't forget what this thing is really all about. Because here's the real truth of the matter. If you really understood Martha, you would know that she was really just stressed. She was really just drowning in the details. I mean, Martha was really just overwhelmed. Anybody ever been there? Me too. <laughs> I will tell you, this past week, my wife will tell you, I felt like I was juggling so much, and there were balls and plates and everything else dropping all over the place, and I was trying to pick them back up, and I just kept trying to juggle and try to toss, and I just felt like I was just overwhelmed. I just had so many things going on. And at one point during the week this past week, 
I went to my office, I shut the door, and I told her, I said, I don't care if nothing else gets done this week. The message has to get done for Sunday morning. And that's what I did. Started the sermon that you're hearing now. I was overwhelmed. I was stressed. I was drowning in the details. And because I'm the big picture guy, I can't see all that and separate it out. And my wife loves me so much that she'll come to me and she'll say, okay, let, 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 let's put this in a, in, a, in a list here. What are the most important things that need to happen first? Well, if I put it on a list and I get to looking at it, I go, oh, okay, that makes much more sense. Oh, I can check this one off right here. Let me just fix this right here. I'll check this. She says, see there, you've already got one thing checked off. Whoa, look at me, man, I'm on a roll. Not to mention I've only got 45 other things. I've got to check off the list. But I'm on a roll. We all get that way sometimes. What it really boils down to is what you're seeing is happening in Martha is the effects of somebody who's carrying too much for too long. In the psychology world, they teach you that there's a good stress, a bad stress, and a chronic stress. And eventually, chronic stress leads to a collapse. Because what that really means is, it's like a bridge. If there's too much weight for too long on the bridge, it's going to collapse. Well, if an individual has too much for too long, we're going to collapse. It's just part of it. Some people call that a nervous breakdown. It happens all the time. More than you know. So now Martha's starting to get some coaching here, and I'm going to wrap this up. Look at verse 42. Amazing. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. Look at verse 42. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. So I believe if it was a life coaching taking place, Jesus was giving her some life coaching lessons. Let me give you real quickly three things that he's really trying to say to her that could help us during this time of year. First thing, not everything deserves your concern. Listen, we live in a world that is... Beep, beep, ding, ding, ring, ring. I mean, emails, Facebook messages, text messages, phone calls. We live in a world that has all of that. And let's be honest, every time we get a notification, we feel like we have to look at it right then. It deserves our attention, and we got to deal with it right on the spot. I mean, I, guilty as charged. I, I, I used to... My phone would buzz. I, I don't leave my ringer on. I don't like to be in a restaurant or anywhere else and have sounds going off. So I put it on vibrate. So sometimes I might be standing there in a conversation talking to you, and I'm like, ooh. They go, what in the world's wrong with him? We're, we're all right. And then I'll reach back here, and I'll pull out my phone, and i go, oh, yeah, yeah. Instagram, man, you blow me up way more than Facebook. What's wrong with you? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Well, here's how we've remedied that. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We don't look at our phone now. Every time our watch buzzes, oh, that's not important. Lightning strike 40 miles from here. <laughs> yep. It's going to rain in Orlando. I don't know if y'all know that or not. Yeah. Lord of mercy. Charlie, you just like my picture? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> See? <laughs> See, that's what we do, though, isn't it? We just transfer it to our, our, our watch. We don't need the watch to tell time by. We just want to know if somebody's calling us. And then I was in here, somebody in here the other day messed me up. They said, I, 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 we were standing here talking, and they said, I'm looking for my phone. And they go, whoop, whoop, whoop. And I thought, what is that? They said, oh, it's, it's a little thing on your, on your watch here that'll find your phone. Yeah. 
And, and, and I said, what? So I left my phone somewhere in another room, and, and I go over here, and I put, find my phone. And it started, whoop, 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 whoop. I went, and I found the phone, and I said, dear Lord, what else are they going to put on there? He go, put my socks on. <laughs> Hadn't got that one yet. I, I need to find the app for that. I can't, ain't got that figured out yet. Yeah, not everything that, that beeps or demands our attention deserves our attention. Let me give you three things that you need to know to help you with that. First of all, real quickly, focus on things that are personal. People instead of projects. Here's my best example of this. <clears throat> Thanksgiving Day, I had 10 million things to do. I don't know about you, but even when I'm off, my mind is going 100 miles a minute of all the things that I still have left to do. Anybody else? Maybe I'm the only one like that. Oh, thanks, Brother Carl. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> yeah, listen, listen. Thanksgiving Day, I'm at home, I'm with my family, and I keep going, okay, Lord, I'm not going to answer any text. I'm not going to answer any calls. I'm not going to do any work. I'm not going to do any work. Maybe I can run off to the bathroom real quick and make some emails and some text messages. Because you know all that stuff happens from the bathroom, right? Just need y'all to know that. Okay, half the posts you look at on Facebook are from somebody who is sitting on the throne. I'm just telling you, that's a bad image, but it is the truth for crying out loud, right? So it's Thanksgiving, and, and I'm trying to you know, keep my sanity, but also be present with my family because they're personal to me and I need to pour into them and I need to be about them instead of the task and all the things I got to do. We ate lunch and it was so good. And I thought, okay, I'm going to get some rest now. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And she says, hey, honey, she says, can we put up all the Christmas decorations? Yeah, I was dying to do that. I couldn't wait to do that. Yeah, let's do that. She was, oh, what was that for? Uh, oh, did I drop my smile? I'm so sorry. I thought I was holding it really good, you know. So I help her. We're putting the tree together, and then we start putting the lights on the tree. You ever got to put your lights on the tree, and half of the strand works, and the other half doesn't? That'll move your level from stress to cussing. <laughs> on Thanksgiving, because guess what's not open on Thanksgiving? Walmart. Yeah, nothing is open where you can get all of that, right? How dumb. So she says, what are we going to do? I said, well, I tell you what we ain't going to do. I am not waiting till tomorrow, bless God, to put this Christmas tree up. Bless God, we are putting this thing up tonight. It ain't dragging out. We're doing it tonight. She says, what are we going to do? I said, you know all the little bags of bulbs that we've been collecting over the years? We're going to use them every single one tonight. Listen. We replaced almost every single bulb in that strand, and I jumped up and down and said, the lights are working, the lights are working, the lights are working, oh my goodness, the lights are working. We got the tree put up, we got the lights put up, we got everything on, and everything was done except for this one window that we have lights going around and some stars hanging in, and it was all in this one little box. Everything else was done, mind you, everything else was done. I said, honey... If it's all right with you, I'll just leave that. I'll put that up tomorrow. Men, y'all know what I'm talking about here. I walked in the bedroom. I walked out, and she had hung one corner. She hung it up here on this corner. This corner didn't hang it up right. She just hung it up because she knew I was going to walk out of the bedroom. We're here, honey. Let me just go ahead and do that for you. Isn't that right? No. <laughs> Carl says, no, that is not what happened. <laughs> well, let me just tell you, that's what happened. We walked out. I went over there and I said, well, you've already started. I might as well just go ahead and just hang this up and put this ball here and put this here and put that there. And she stood back and she goes, oh, baby, that looks so good. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I got personal. I poured into my family. I'm glad I did. And then we sat back and we watched the beautiful Christmas lights and we watched television and we just made memories. See, focus on what's personal and, and then the experiential. 
always choose experiences over tasks. There will always be something else to do. But put experiences at the top of your list. Listen, Martha could have sat right there with Jesus as well, but she chose to do all the tasks and not have the experience. Mary had the experience that she would never forget. Oh, and then listen to this. We need to focus on things that are not easily duplicatable. You know why we don't do a lot of things today? Because we think we'll have tomorrow. We do. I told the first service, I'm, I'm so proud of Reagan, our youngest daughter. She's in theater and she loves it. She is a drama queen and, and, and not like that kind of drama, <laughs> but like theater drama, you know. She, she enjoys all things theater and roles and plays and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's so easy. We get wrapped up, and she's got a, a play and stuff coming up, and, you know, and, and I got to go. I mean, I get to go. You know how easy it is for us to say, man, I got to go to that. But what if we said, I, I get to go to that? Because she just turned 16. She's got two more years. She'll be an adult. I get to go to that. I, what, I get to be out in the, in the crowd yelling and screaming, Woo, that's my girl, you go! Well, what, what if we get to do that? That's not easily duplicatable. When it happens, it's over. Well, when you're, your kids, your grandkids, as God is working in their life and He's moving in their life, don't miss... Those things that are not easily duplicatable. They're only going to walk once for the first time. They're only going to speak once for the first time. They're only going to do all of these things for the first time. Don't miss whether it's your family, whether it's your friends, or whether it's your church. You know why we don't do a lot of extra stuff in the church it, as individuals? Oh, there'll be another one next year. I had a guy tell me right before he died, he said to me, he said, Pastor, he said, you know what I regret? I kept telling you I was going to come. I, I kept telling you we're going to be at that Christmas dinner. I kept telling you, oh, we're going to serve. Oh, we're, we're going to get involved in a, in a group. Oh, we're... And it was the day before he died, and I was standing by his bed, and he said, you know the things I regret? All the things I said I was going to do that I didn't do. And he said, you know what? All I have is my small little family. And I said, and that's good enough. But he said, you know what? He said, I don't have any friends. I'm going to die and I don't have any friends. I'm going to die and I don't have the church family outside my door praying for me. I don't have those people that are going to be there to bring food to my family. I don't have And he just kept going on and on. And he said, I wish I had made a church family much more priority in my life than what I did. Can I tell you something? When we say we'd love to see you at Graceway, we're not saying that because we want to fill a seat. It, it doesn't matter whether the seat's filled or whether the seat's empty. I got to preach the same sermon regardless. We're going to sing the same songs regardless. And God's going to show up and He's going to move whether there's five or whether there's 105. But you need the encouragement and the fellowship of the people around you. You need to be built up and loved on. Because there will come a day where you'll be in the hospital and you'll need somebody to be there. A lady said to me this morning, she said, would you pray for my sister? She, she goes to another church. She's been in the hospital a week. She said, my sister can't get anybody from that church to come and visit her and pray with her. 
And I said, where is your sister? And she said, right here in the local hospital. And I said, well, can't I go pray with her? Can't I go minister to her? And she said, she doesn't understand why her church won't. Folks, listen, if you're involved in a church, a church that is a family that's going to love on you, and when something goes wrong, we need to be there. It's going off on a tangent. Can I just tell you something? Look around you. See who's not here? You need to call them today and say, hey, look, we missed you this morning. Where were you? I, I sit up here. You probably see me on my phone sometimes. I'm making a list of people that I'm not seeing on Sunday morning. And you know what I do many times? I don't always get the time to do it, but sometimes you know what I do? Especially if the Spirit of God has really impressed me. Man, I get out of here and the next day, I, I'm on the phone, or I'm messaging, I'm texting. Hey, I just want you to know I'm caring about you. I love you. Where are you? I'm just concerned for you. Because the pastor, I have watched care over your souls. I'm going to give an account for where you are, for what's going on in your life. Let me, let me give you the second thing. Jesus told her, you have to look for the important things. I've already told you that. Look for what's important and go for it. The third thing, the best joy is the joy that lasts. The best joy is the joy that lasts. Folks, don't invest in stuff that doesn't matter. Invest in things that make a difference. Here's why I say that. Because when you're stressed out, there are three questions you need to ask yourself. Here's the first question. Have I set the bar for joy too high? Folks, sometimes we want to be perfectionist, and when we're perfectionist, it sets the bar for joy too high. And if you don't meet that bar, guess what? We get stressed, we get frustrated, we get afraid, we get overwhelmed because we didn't meet the bar. I tell everybody, when you go on a mission trip, two things you need to know, flexible and adaptable. Flexible and adaptable. Set the bar and then be flexible. Sometimes you need to change. Sometimes you need to be flexible. Sometimes you need to be adaptable. Here's a second question. Will this matter five years from now? Some of y'all got upset because the turkey was too dry. Some of y'all got upset. Some of you got angry. The dressing didn't turn out just right. I mean, the stuffing didn't turn out right for you. I got angry because we didn't have no dressing. Imagine that. I told my wife, I said, I've got to find somebody who will give you lessons, teach you how to make dressing. She didn't grow up eating dressing. She grew up eating stuffing. I said, you've got to find somebody who can teach you how to get dressing because we don't want a divorce. I'm just kidding. I said, here's the deal. Dressing. She loves me. She curled her hair this morning, by the way. That's how we know she loves me. I'm just kidding. Will this matter in five years? Listen, that turkey that was too dry, you won't remember next year whether it was dry or not. It won't matter. It won't make any difference in the world. And here's the last thing. Am I missing out on the important stuff? While I'm worrying about all the details, while I'm stressing, am I missing out on important stuff? You only get one life to live. I'm a mama's number one A1 baby boy. I call my mama every single day. Even if I just get to talk to her for five minutes. People say, why in the world do you do that? Because there will come a day where I won't be able to call her. And I'm going to do it while I still can. It's the important stuff. There'll come a day that I'll want to pick up the phone to call and she won't be there. So what's important to me is to do it now while I can. The most important thing you can do today is make a connection with Jesus. Experience Him. If you're watching online today, you need to hear this. God doesn't care about anything else right now except for you and I sitting at His feet and absorbing all that He is. And if you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, it's the greatest thing you can do this Christmas. It's the greatest thing.
And when you have that connection with Jesus, I promise you, I promise you, it'll bring peace that passes all understanding. It'll help with the stress because then you can turn it all over to Him. If you're here this morning, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about reading the Bible. I'm not talking about having some Christian education. I'm not talking about even praying a prayer. I'm not talking about being baptized. I'm talking about has there been a moment in your life where you have said, God, I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. I receive your salvation. I receive your gift of forgiveness. I turn from my sin and I choose to follow you. I receive you as Lord over my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. It's that simple. Jesus said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Guys, this is not rocket science. We've made it way too difficult, but I can tell you this. If you choose Jesus, you must forsake the world. You can't walk with both. If you take Jesus, you got to forsake the world. The Scripture says we are in the world, but not of the world. I know, I know Jesus was a friend of sinners. He was. But he did not participate in their sin. Today, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, I plead with you, give your heart and life to Jesus today. Make him the Lord of your life. Turn from the world and start following Christ. It'll be the best decision you've ever made in your life. Would you stand with me all over the house? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for your word today. God, many of us have been stressed to the max. And Lord, today we just need to come and lay it down. Today we need to come and we need to ask those questions. Are we making it personal? Are we making it experiential? Are, are we doing what's important? Father, I pray that we will always, always keep the big picture in mind. And the big picture is you. God, if we mess up everything else, if we get everything else right and we mess up with you, what have we gained? So God, today I pray that if there's anyone in the sound of my voice who does not know you, may this be the day they would come forward and they would surrender their heart and life to Jesus and just say, I need salvation. I need Jesus. I need to turn it all over. Whatever you need to do in the hearts and lives of people, God, I pray that you would do it today. I pray, God, as these altars are open. May people literally flock to these altars to trade in their stress for true Christmas joy. God, have your will in your way right now, I pray in Jesus' name.